Hey all, Ron here from Military Images Magazine with a new episode of Life on the Civil War Research Trail. Today, my research took me to Arkansas, and that reminded me of an individual that I profiled some years ago. He's pictured here. His name is Howell A. Rayburn. His nickname was Doc. I want to tell you his story. It's a memorable one. I want to start by taking you to northern Arkansas in the fall of 1862 in the town of Desark. There, local boys in town came under the influence of Rayburn. He had a delicate physique and long, tawny hair that some said made him look innocent like a child. But there was a streak of darkness that lurked in the wild blue eyes one historian noted it seemed at times to have lost every vestige of tenderness, compassion, and mercy, especially for those who differed with his views. Before he landed at Desark, Rayburn had served as a private in a regiment of Texas Mounted Infantry, and he had arrived in town, this community along the White River, with his grimy, dust-covered Texas comrades, earlier in 1862. At some point soon after they arrived, Rayburn had fallen ill and he was too sick when it came time to move out. So he stayed behind in town. His fellow Texans thought he was going to die. Well, Rayburn had survived worse. He was born in Tennessee, one of six children, raised by an itinerant farmer named Hodge and his wife, Susan. Rayburn endured a hard scrabble life in southern states, several southern states. They eventually made their way looking for a better life in East Texas. At this point, Hodge and Susan disappeared from the record books, very possibly victims of a disease or some other malady, leaving Rayburn and his siblings orphaned and they took refuge with area families in that part of Texas. About that time, the war came in 1861, and Rayburn joined the Confederate Army, perhaps looking for a new home. Who knows why he joined? Maybe he wanted to escape his meager resistance or perhaps for patriotic motives. Whatever the reason, he slung his slender frame into the saddle of his mount and rode off to hunt Yankees. Rayburn, according to one account, wore, quote, a sombrero of unusual proportions, the brim adorned with small bells that jingled with each motion of the horse's gait, securely fastened about the crown as though with a garland of withered ivy glistened the scales of a Texas rattler, end quote. The writer continued, his, quote, accoutrements were a saber, two huge Colt revolvers, and a pair of immense spurs clamped tightly against the horse's flanks, end quote. It's quite a picture. Here he is without those items. I'd love to see a photograph of him with that sombrero. Now, to move on. When not fighting the Union Army, Rayburn targeted civilians. At least one warrant was issued for his arrest on charges of harassment. One writer said, quote, he was often accused of committing depredations on friends as well as foes. The historian who wrote that made no additional comment. For the most part, Rayburn managed to stay on the good side of the locals in Desarc in that fall of 1862, while a sympathetic family nursed him back to health. While he was recovering and recuperating, the Federals had moved into the area and made it next to impossible for him to rejoin his command. So he remained in town and hatched a plan to recruit volunteers for his own independent command. His activities soon came to the attention of a Confederate colonel in the area named Thomas H. McRae, who determined to help young Rayburn. Rayburn inspired about 50, that's the estimate, adventurous local boys from surrounding towns to enlist. 
he impressed one volunteer from the nearby town of West Point who said, quote, his face and makeup looked like a 17-year-old girl. We worshipped him around West Point, end quote. Old Rayburn made quite an impression. All of these youths were armed with shotguns and possessed little in the way of equipment and horses. Ragtag band voted for officers, a common practice in the volunteer armies on both sides. No surprise, they elected Rayburn as captain or their guerrilla chieftain, as one man later called him. Rayburn's first lieutenant, his second in command, was a man named Lilburn Cox, known as Lil. He was the son of a Baptist minister in town. Union intelligence, by the way, was keeping an eye on these boys, and their intelligence told them that Rayburn's company was serving as a bodyguard to Colonel McRae. Now, Rayburn's irregular company of partisan rangers went down in history with the nickname or nom de guerre, Phantom Unit. Had a reputation for lightning quick raids into Union occupied Arkansas near the White and Mississippi rivers. Rayburn did not rise to the level of notoriety attained by a, someone like Colonel John Singleton Mosby in Virginia or Captain William C. Quantrill in Kansas and Missouri. He did, however, become a hero to Southern sympathizers in Arkansas. They called him Yellow Doc, or simply Doc, which is probably a reference to his hair color, or maybe the illness that sidelined and sickened him in Desarc. His enemies, both the Union Army and civilians who got on his wrong side, just called him a bandit or a banditti. There was an admiring biographer who recounted Rayburn's audacity. Here's a story one evening preceding Christmas that young soldiers, quote, jested of what good old St. Nicholas had in store for them. Rayburn in his droll way interrupted with, boys, I'm going to be Santa Claus. I will go within the federal lines tomorrow night and dance with those Yankee officers and bring each of you one of Uncle Sam's best cavalry horses. That is, he concluded with added thoughts, if I can pass the picket lines unmolested. Well, the next day, Rayburn visited the home of a sympathizer who could be trusted. And from the wife of this loyal Southern partisan, he asked for and procured the loan of a dress shoes, and hat. Garbed in this costume, he stole stealthily into the night within federal lines and walked boldly into the officer's quarters where there happened to be a dance in progress. He received an invitation from a gallant federal officer and complying with the request, Rayburn danced his way with the enemy, swaying to the martial music of Uncle Sam's regimental band, so the story goes. After an evening on the dance floor, Rayburn bid good night to his newly made acquaintances with assurances to them of attending later social functions. Then, so the story goes, the historian writes, he stole quietly under cover of darkness to the corral, mounting what he judged to be the fleetest horse. He easily stampeded a score of others and was in full flight before the astonished soldiers were fully aroused. His promise of a Christmas gift to the men was fulfilled. Rayburn claimed one of those horses for himself, a magnificent chestnut sorrel named Limber Jim. You won't find a mention of this episode in any official records. But there were a number of union reports filed in the summer and fall of 1864 that mention a Captain Rayborn and his troops involved in minor raids that frustrated federal commanders, but did not significantly alter military affairs in that part of Arkansas. One of those raids that are mentioned in the union reports occurred in the village of West Point, and I mentioned earlier, it was that hotbed of excitement and enthusiasm for Rayburn from the local boys. It occurred on July 28th, 1864. So the story goes, so the report goes, a detachment of 20 Union soldiers 
from the 11th Missouri Cavalry on a scouting mission had pulled up at a local house. These soldiers, these Union soldiers, failed to post guards and, quote, were surprised by a party of rebels numbering about 60 under command of Rayborn, who were dressed in federal uniform principally, end quote. That's according to an after-action report filed by Brigadier General Christopher C. Andrews. Both sides opened fire, leaving one Union cavalryman dead and two of Rayburn's men killed. The next day, General Andrews fired off a reminder to one of his senior officers on the ground. He said, quote, impressed upon the mind of every officer and man that watchfulness must not be relaxed in any instance in the enemy's country, end quote. <clears throat> Pardon me. Less concerned about Rayburn was the Union commander of the military district of Little Rock, Eugene A. Carr. A respected brigadier and Medal of Honor recipient, he was downright dismissive when he referred to Rayburn and another guerrilla captain in a note to a subordinate on November 18, 1864. Carr said, quote, they will probably hang around and try to steal stock and cut off small parties, end quote. Rayburn managed to elude the Federals. They never caught him until the end of hostilities, but he barely survived the war. There's conflicting accounts of his demise. One source says that, quote, after peace had been declared, one of the Confederate soldiers who hated Rayburn slipped back and shot him one evening at sundown. He lived about 20 minutes after he was shot, quote, end quote. His horse, Limber Jim, was reportedly sold at a government auction and succumbed to disease shortly after the sale. Another source claimed that Rayburn was eventually captured or imprisoned by federal authorities for guerrilla activities. There he contracted tuberculosis while he was in custody. Friends obtained his release on the basis that he would not live long, and he didn't. He died soon after. His wife, Martha Ann, whom he had married in June of 1865, survived him. Rayburn's re remains reportedly were buried in Des Arcs, a wood headboard that marked the site, eventually decayed and disappeared, and the exact location of his grave site is not known. So there you have it, the story of Doc Rayburn, the banditti, the partisan ranger, commander of the phantom unit of about 50 Arkansas boys who tore up the supplies, took some supplies and messed with the Union forces in the area. Thanks for listening. See you on the next episode of Life on the Civil War Research Trail.